looking out in Isaiah uh, chapter 6. And we'll be looking at verses 1 through 7 as we go along. So, Lord, I just ask you once again for help uh, that, that you will speak, that you'll open our eyes, that you'll give words to say, that you'll anoint the things that are said, but especially that your word would have impact in our thoughts, in our understanding, in opening our eyes, and in really just enlarging our, our vision of you, that we could have a more appropriate, more realistic view of who you are, and as such, that again, it will, will affect us, and, and Lord, that, that you would be honored um, in the time that we spend together, and, and that this will be uh, under your authority, uh, but under your, your blessing as we just seek to have a greater sense of your holiness. And we ask it for your name's sake and for our good, Lord. Amen. So the holiness of God, last week we talked about things such as God being self-sufficient. He has no need. There's nothing that we can add nor take away from God, that God is self-existent, that he has always been, nothing caused him to be. Nothing can affect him, can undo him. He always has been, always will be. And as Revelation tells us, he's the Alpha and the Omega. That's the beginning and the end of the Greek alphabet. He's the first and the last. He's the beginning. He's the end. That, that there is nothing outside of God. And, and, and so we were looking at, you know, what is the nature of God? What is he like? Not so much what does God do, which are a lot of when we think of the attributes of God, I, I think that's where our minds maybe go, like what, you know, like, like God's omniscience, he knows everything and therefore, or he is all powerful and therefore, or he is uh, in present in all places, therefore, how does the love of God or the wrath of God, how is it acted out? But in these first um, few weeks, I just want to look at it to see if we can have a sense of the nature of God. What is he like? And to get a, a better view of, of who God is that sets him apart, that, that gives us a, a greater, really a picture again of reality. What is the reality concerning God? And therefore, it will also tell us, so what's the reality concerning man? And that's what we see so clearly in Isaiah 6 when we see the vision that Isaiah had of, of, of what God was like and then how it affected him. So the, the word holy is, of course, a word that we're all very familiar with. We, we, we use it in reference to, you know, to God. We use it in reference to various things, uh, phrases such as, you know, someone being holier than thou, you know, that they think they, they're better than everybody else or, or that they don't have wrong or what. You know, we, this is not an uncommon term to us, but, but from my experience, I, I didn't, learn until not that many years ago that there was much more to the to an understanding of what the word holy means than what I had ever really given thought to and so it is very helpful to me and I, I think we see it here um, and I would say for the most part probably and I would say this was true with me was that there are, there are basically two aspects to holiness and really the one that is secondary is the one that had the primary position in my mind, and I think maybe does in, in the mind of a lot of people, but it's actually the secondary idea of holiness, and that is the idea of, pureless, of, of being a purity, of, of sinlessness, of, of perfection, which is an absolute truth when it comes to, to the word holy and, and how God is, that there is absolute purity. There is, there is no stain that there, there is absolute perfection when you, when you think of, of, of some of the references, like when Jesus was uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, 
and what he looked like. It said it was, he shone with such a brilliance and a brightness and, and said it was beyond anything that any launderer could ever make pure and clean. And, and, and that, that uh, Paul told Timothy that, that God is immortal and he is in, that no man can see him, can come to him, that he dwells in unapproachable light. I mean, this, this sense of purity is the absolute truth, this perfection. But that is really a secondary thing uh, in, in regard to, to the idea and even what the word itself means. So the word holy means really to cut. It means to cut and to separate. It means to, to put it aside, that it's for some special use. We're going to do something different with this thing over here because it's not just of the common lump. It's not of the common group. It's kind of like the word culling something from the herd. You set it apart for special use. It is distinct. And so when we think about God, really, this separateness of God is the first thing to think about regarding who he is what he is like, what is his nature, and where is he in relation to mankind, this distinctness, this separateness, this category that is really it's completely other. And as I've said this before, that there are only two categories in all of the universe. There's God, and then there's everything else. Everything else proceeded from, was created by, has owes its existence to God. So nothing else is like God. So not even the greatest archangel, not even the seraphim that we're singing about, which means the burning ones, no Gabriel nor Michael, or, you know, the archangels, there is nothing actually like God. He is completely distinct, absolutely separate. And the way that, that it is phrased here, we'll, we'll explain in a few minutes, really tells us that that is the perspective that we need to have regarding how God is. So let's look at verses 1 through 7 of Isaiah 6 and see what Isaiah saw and then what it really revealed to him. It says, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out, while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And then one of the seraphim flew to me, with the burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs, he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. <clears throat> so in, in this passage and in the one that we read already in Revelation, it's the only place that any attribute of God is mentioned three times. Holy, holy, holy. You never hear love, 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 or mercy, 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 or wrath, wrath, wrath. Though God exhibits all those things, those are attributes, but this is the only one that is ever repeated three times, and we see that twice in Scripture. So one of the things that, that this tells us is in Hebrew language, if they wanted to emphasize something, give it great importance, if they wanted to put it to the superlative degree, you know, like good and then better and then best, that superlative, they did it through either pluralizing a word or repeating a word. You know, Jesus would say like things like in the, in the King James, verily, verily, 
It's like, okay, I want to get your attention. I'm not just saying verily, let's know verily, verily. That means like this is really important. I'm emphasizing this. Well, here, though, is the only time we see anything in reference to God mentioned three times. So this tells us this has ultimate, ultimate importance. It, it is the superlative expression of what God is like. No other attribute is given this weight. It's something that therefore should grab our attention. It could cause us to say, well, so why this emphasis? Why is it repeated? What is, try, is, is to be communicated to us through this being said three times? What is it that we need to know and understand? What does this tell me about what God is like? Why is it repeated? It's not just there from a poetic standpoint. It's there for a reason so that we will know more clearly and recognize more fully what God is like. So the problem that we see with man, and this is where we first went wrong, was not understanding that there is this massive gap, this, um, this, this chasm between us and God that cannot be bridged by anything. God is so distinct, so far removed from us, there is no way that we could approach God, nor does he, could he bring himself in his glory to exist with us because we know that we die if we see God. We'll look at some of those passages. But this is where man has gone wrong. We, we go all the way back to the garden. What did Satan say to Adam and Eve? The serpent said to the woman, surely... Uh, you will not die if you eat of the fruit. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. So right there was the temptation. Oh, I can be like God? There's not that big of a distance between us? Oh, then, you know, that, that sounds pretty appealing. And look how good that looks. And, you know, I would like to be more like God. And that was the lie. You can be like God. Psalm 50, God himself expresses this as he goes through 20 verses in, in, in Psalm 50 of expressing what the people were really like and, and why he didn't accept their sacrifices and so forth. And in verse 21 of Psalm 50, he says, it's because you thought that I was just like you, that everything's okay. Do what you want to do. Still perform your religious stuff. Do, do the things that, you're, that, that your life you know, normally consists of. And you think it's okay because you think that I'm just like you. And then he says, but I'm going to state the case in order to you. That's what he did with Job. What a beautiful expression of Job, who is a truly righteous man, as righteous as any man on earth. And God even challenges Satan by telling him that. But at the end of it, you get to chapters 38 through 42, and you find out Job realizes, he just says, I am vile. I'm going to put my hand over my mouth. I'm going to shut up because who do I think I am? Now that I've seen more of the reality of who you are, God, I just need to sit in silence and put my face in the dirt. That's the thing that man, we, we don't by nature, because we are created in the image of God, and there is a likeness to God. There are things that we share with God. For instance, we can actually share to some degree in his holiness. We can share in his love. We, we can share in his goodness. We can share in certain things with God. And then there are things that we can't. We're not omniscient and omnipresent and all-powerful. We're not those kind of things. But, the, but man wants to be the fullest extent he he can be, and sadly, we have often put ourselves in the sense that, well, God's not that far removed from us because, after all, we're creating his image, and after all, you know, I am this, that, and the other thing, and we give ourselves credit where we don't necessarily deserve it. But if we don't see God really as who he is, how could we rightly worship him? How could we rightly relate to him? We have to know what God is truly like. That's the foundation of our worship. And what did Jesus tell the woman at the well? When she said, do we worship here? Do we worship in Jerusalem? He said, there's coming a day where you won't worship anywhere. In particular, you're going to worship in spirit and in truth. You have to know truth. And, and so he's saying that is the foundation. And you need to know what the reality is concerning God if you're going to worship him appropriately. 
And so this first reality is that God is holy. He is separate. He's distinct. He's nothing actually like us in reality. He has made us somewhat to share in aspects of, of, of his being, but there is nothing, nothing like God. God is holy, and his holiness describes every attribute that he has. So talking about distinctiveness, separateness, nothing like it, then therefore the love of God, there's nothing like the love of God. No matter how wonderful our love could be, it could never be like the holy love of God because it's completely separate from the type of love that man can have, and yet we can share in it to some degree. The wrath of God is absolutely pure and holy and separate and judges everything's right, everything rightly because he himself is absolutely perfect, but his wrath, his anger, his judgment is a different kind of judgment. It's absolutely perfect and righteous and it's distinct. Whether it be his goodness, whether it be his mercy, whatever attribute we're talking about, it is as he is. And if he is completely different than we are, then his expression of those attributes is completely different than the way that we might be able to express them. They're absolutely pure and perfect. And so God is not only holy in his being, he's holy in everything he does, meaning it's, it is the perfection of all things. It is distinct. It is removed from anything that man could, could, could equal or approach to. So when we talk about this separateness of God, again, we go back to the idea of this this, this cutting, this, this, this separating, this, this removal of things. That it is something for a particular use. It's not of the common. It's not the ordinary. So Exodus 15 says, Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders. Going back to Exodus again, they've seen what's happened in, in Egypt. They've seen what's happened as they've worked their way toward the wilderness. And they see this and express it that it is a majestic holiness. In 1 Samuel, it says there is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. He is absolutely un like anything else, nothing else equates, nothing else is, is in, in the slightest way similar. Revelation 15, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name, for you alone are holy. And in Isaiah 55, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. This, this great gap, this insurmountable distance we can't get there we just can't get there the only way is is God is going to have to come to us because we have no hope so there are three passages out of Exodus I wanted us to look at that give some sense of this Exodus 19 Exodus 33 Exodus 34 just some verses out of those we're all familiar with the circumstances in Exodus 19 you know, uh, Moses is, has gone up onto the mountain and, and he's gathered all the people to Sinai. And it's this sense of, of, of the awesomeness, the terrifying awesomeness of God. So in Exodus 19, verse 12 says, you shall, you shall set bounds for the people all around the mountain, he's saying, and beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch even the border of it because whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death you don't just approach God casually this is serious serious business moving on to verse 16 still in Exodus 19 so it came about on the third day when it was morning that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled now, this is what it was like to be in the presence of God, this trembling. They don't know what they're, what they're about to experience, but it creates great fear because of the power that, that they have 
that they find themselves so tiny up against. What could I do? Verse 17, And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke. And you go back to Isaiah. The temple, it says, was filling with smoke. Here again we see the smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with thunder. And the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And then the Lord spoke to Moses. He said, go down, warn the people so that they do not break through to the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. And also, so this is all the people, the common person, but now even the priesthood, in verse 22, let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, or else the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, Set bounds about the mountain and consecrate it. And then the Lord said to him, Go down and come up again, you and Aaron, with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, or he will break forth upon them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. So this was their experience with a somewhat, you know, face-to-face encounter with God. Trembling, fear, threat of death, the reality of this this unmatched power that they knew nothing about nor could contend with in any way. You move to Exodus 33, Moses and his experience again with God. 33.18, Moses said, I pray you, Lord, show me your glory. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and show compassion on whom I will show compassion. There's the sovereignty of God. No one can thwart his hand, stop what he's going to do, demand an answer from God. God said, I'll have compassion on whom I'm going to have compassion. And I will be gracious to whom I'm going to be gracious. I am the Lord. Verse 21 No, no, I'm sorry, verse 20. But he said, God said, you cannot, Moses, even you, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. So then the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me, and you shall stand there on the rock, and it will come about while my glory is passing by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away, and you shall see my back. But my face shall not be seen. That's for Moses' preservation. And yet Moses wanted to know more. What are you really like? God, I want to see you. Look what you've called me to do. These millions of people I'm responsible for. He's saying, who are you going to send with me? And Lord, if you don't go with us, don't send us. You have to go. You alone are my hope. And he wants to see God more fully who he, as he is. And God says, I'll show you something of me. But not the whole thing, not my face, because you can't live if you see me. So then what was it like when Moses comes down off the mountain? The next chapter, chapter 34, verse 29. It came about when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand as he was coming down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with him with God. So when Aaron and all the sons of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Now, this is just a reflection of God, and it petrified the people. This man's face is glowing. So Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers in the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke to them. Afterward, all the sons of Israel came near, and he commanded them to do everything that the Lord had spoken to him on Sinai. So he's given them the law. 
And when Moses had finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take off the veil until he came out. And whenever he came out and spoke to the sons of Israel, what he had been commanded, the sons of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. So Moses would replace the veil over his face until he went in to speak with God again. Again, some sense of what we're dealing with here that is unlike anything man can do, man can produce. And you see the effect, the terror, not only of seeing the thunder or hearing the thunder and seeing the lightning and the smoke and the mountain shaking, but even on the face of a man, God's glory reflected as he spoke with Moses to the point that he had to cover his face because it terrified the people so much. So just as with Adam and Eve, just as with Psalm 50, we tend to reduce God down to manageable terms, down to things we can understand, things that in a sense we can, can control or, or know how to use when, when the need is there. We want God to come down and, and, and come down to, to our level in a sense. We have this tendency to conform him to our likeness rather than we being conformed to his. We oftentimes want to worship God in a manner that more, is more suitable, more enjoyable, something that, that I prefer to do rather than how God has commanded us to worship him. One that reflects the honor, the glory, the, the position, the holiness of God. We want, again, to, to accommodate ourselves, still make it God-like and godly, but, but let's accommodate it some. Let's adjust it to where we have a sin, in a sense, get more out of it. But God is the sovereign Lord. He's the one who says, this is how it is to be. And to view God then properly will cause the proper reaction. It's interesting that if you look in Isaiah 6 and, I, and Revelation 4, both times where holy, holy, holy is said, there is a completely different reaction, but neither one is casual. Neither one is is. Ho-hum. What was the reaction in Isaiah 6? It said, then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined. That word ruined, in, in, you know, in the King James, it says I'm undone. It literally means to disintegrate. He felt like he was going to come apart at the seams, that he would unravel. There was no hope of escape. To see God in that way, he said, I am ruined. I'm destroyed. So his reaction to the holiness of God was that I can't face that and live, and it brought to light his sin. Well, do you think there's probably anybody more righteous in Isaiah's day than righteous? I mean, than, than Isaiah more righteous than he? Probably not. I mean, he is the voice of God to the people, and yet he sees himself as a man of unclean lips. He lives among a people of unclean lips. I think, really, if you, you, you look at what Jesus said about where what, what defiles a man? It's not what goes into his mouth. It's what comes out. And where do those come from? It comes from your heart. That's where thefts and adulteries and fornications and murders come from, from the heart. And so really, what we speak is more the evidence of who we really are. And so I'm sure there was much more than just, oh, he says bad words. I don't think that's what he's saying. He said, I am corrupted, and it's evidence in the way that I and my people all live. And it brought to light his sin, and it frightened him, it terrified him because he knew he could not stand up to this God. He said, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So his vision brought woe and a sense of destruction and a recognition of his sin and his hopelessness before this holy and distinct separate God. But what did Revelation? In Revelation 4, it said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. It brought praise and a sense of recognition of really who God is. Everything was made by you, and only you alone are worthy. But in both cases, when you see who God is, it demands a response Either woe is me, I am undone, O Lord, have mercy on me, or praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. 
but it brings about a rational right response to God. There cannot be a casual one. What did Peter do after the great catch of fish when they'd fished all night? Jesus said, throw it on the other side. Well, okay. They hauled in like 153 fish. They had to get other boats to come help. And what was Peter's response to that? When Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, go away from me. I'm a sinful man. In other words, you're not. You're something special. You're different. I don't know what you are altogether, but I know what I am. And it brings it to light. And it puts me on my face before you. What did John do? Revelation 1. He sees the Jesus that he lived with for three years, but now in a glorified form. And when he turned and he saw him, he said, I fell down as a dead man before him. That's what seeing the reality of who God is does to us. God's holiness cannot be taken lightly. And briefly, let's look at a few places where people mistakenly did not have the appropriate response to God's holiness. Right at the beginning, Aaron is made a priest and his sons, Nadab and Abihu. What a wonderful thing that the father and the sons are going to get to be the, the priests together of the Lord. The very first ones ever inaugurated. We are the priests. And before hardly any time had gone by, Nadab and Abihu find a different way, a better way, a more appealing way, whatever it might be, to worship God rather than how he specifically said, this is how you're to worship. This is what the incense is to be made of, and this is how you're to burn it. And they offered what is called strange fire before God, and God killed them both. Boom, immediately, right in front of their father. Imagine if those were your two boys, and you're watching that, how are you going to respond and Moses said, just hold, better keep your peace. Do you realize what just happened? Do you realize why that happened? They were, they were doing something unauthorized by God. So Moses, I mean, so Aaron did hold his peace. He held back. But that's how serious it was. God said, you will not trifle. You will not play with my worship. Moses himself didn't get to go into the promised land. God said, go to the rock and speak to it. But instead he went and he beat it like he had in the previous time. And then he was criticizing the people, saying, you rebellious people, you stiff-necked people. And what did God say? You failed to make my name holy before the people. You're not going into the promised land. I'm going to let you see it, but you're not going in because you failed to keep my name holy before the people. You took things into your own hands. You thought... You let your anger supersede what I told you to do. You were acting on your own account, not according to, to reverencing me. Uzzah, when the ark had been captured by the Philistines, they were bringing it back, but not bringing it back according to God's prescription, carried by poles by the priesthood. They put it on an ox cart, and the ox cart, the ox you know, loses balance, the cart tips. Uzzah thinks that the Ark of the Covenant is going to come off. He reaches up to hold it, to protect it in a sense, and immediately is killed. Because for one, it wasn't altogether his sin. It was the sin of the priesthood who didn't do it according to what had been prescribed by them. But they were treating it more as a casual thing, as, as something that, that they, they saw really more like a good luck charm, perhaps. This Ark of the Covenant it could really help us in our battles and so forth. They did not treat God as holy. And even though in a sense it was innocent, that ignorance and that lack of following what God had told him to do cost Uzzah his life. Another instance where the ark had been among a group of people at Beth Shemesh, it said that 50,070 men were killed because they looked into the ark of the Lord. And the men of Beth Shemesh, Shemesh said... Who is able to stand before the Lord to this holy God? He killed him. He said, you're not going to treat me as something that's common, that's ordinary. I'm holy. I'm set apart. I'm distinct. I'm removed from you. Do not treat me in that way. What happened to Ananias and Sapphira? Early church. Book of Acts. Sold some property. Everybody was selling property, bringing it to the church. But they sold the property and said, here's how much we got, and here's what we're giving to the church. But they kept back some for themselves. Wasn't that they couldn't. Peter said, you could have done that. Just be honest. Don't lie to the Holy Spirit. You lied to the Holy Spirit. You're dead, Ananias. A few hours later, Sapphira comes in, not knowing what happened to her husband. She gives the same story. He gave her a chance to tell the truth. She didn't. She falls dead as well, and they hauled her out. God was serious about the church. 
You don't trifle with holy things. You don't lie to the Spirit of God. You must maintain me as holy because I'm not like you. I am the Lord. I'm the sovereign. I'm supreme. I am the ruler, the king. Who do you think you are? The model prayer. What do we see there? The first thing, hallowed be your name. And it's not really only a statement of what he is. It's more of a command. It's like, Lord, your name is to be hallowed. We are to, to recognize your distinction. And until we do, and I, I wish I could share with you a, a video I watched this week regarding this, that, that he was saying, really, until we do that, Will any of the rest of what follows ever happen? Will God extend his kingdom? Will his will be done and his kingdom come? Because if we will not hallow God's name in our lives and in our churches, why would God deign to come down to us to do anything through us and for us? Until he is hallowed. And that's why this was saying, said, that's really the first petition Jesus gives. Oh, may your name be hallowed among your people, reverenced. May you be holy. May you be... Be recognized as who you truly are. Then, Lord, then may your kingdom come. But until we do, will God act among his people? And looking at the Ten Commandments, the first commandment, you know, no other gods before me. Then no images, no idols. And then don't take my name in vain. We see all of that points back to this separateness, this distinctness, this perfection, this this indescribable being that we don't want to in any way lower nor profane in the way that we live. And taking his name in vain is not a curse word. That's not really what he's talking about. He said, living your life as though I'm not. Living your life claiming one thing but living unlike that. That's taking God's name in vain because I proclaim one thing but I'm not living it out. That's really what the, the vain refers to. Certainly we don't use his name in any way literally that profanes it, but it's more to do with are you living in such a way that your desire is to honor me and represent me and follow me? So God's separateness, his, his completely other category, which then quickly brings us to the reality of what we often think about, the purity, the purity of God. And so we see again in verse 5, we see what Isaiah saw. Woe is me, I'm undone. I see my sin, I recognize my sinfulness. And yet what a grace of God to show us our sinfulness. Oh, what a mercy of God to say, here's what you really are. Oh, that's the only way to, that's the only hope we have. Is to know our sinfulness, to know our need, to know that I can't save myself, to know that I am hopeless before him. And that's why only the poor in spirit enter into the kingdom of heaven. Only those who are broken, who claim nothing of themselves, Oh, it's only by your righteousness, by your goodness, God. Thank you for showing my sin, showing me my sin, not letting me live in, in deception that I am something I'm not. And so seeing God's holiness demonstrates his absolute purity. So what could Isaiah do? He said, I'm undone. Nothing I can do. What did he do at that point? Nothing. But God acted. Verse 6, then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. That's the only hope we have. God has to do something to me. It's nothing I can do. I cannot approach this holy God. I cannot purify myself, clean myself. God has to cleanse me. He does it with the fire of his Holy Spirit that comes into our lives, that, that wipes away the sin, that, that gives us a new life, gives us a new birth. We become a new person in Christ. The old things are passed away. New things have come. And then our nature is changed. Our desires are changed. I don't want those same old things anymore. I want the righteousness. I want the holiness. I want the purity of God. One quote on this said, We spend our entire lives... Veiling ourselves from the true character of God. Our natural bent, our natural inclination is to hide ourselves. Well, what did Adam and Eve do when they sinned? 
They hid themselves. They tried to cover it up. That's what all mankind does. Somehow wash it away, cover it up, ignore it, hide ourselves, whatever it might be. He said that's our inclination, to hide ourselves from him because we know that as soon as the holy appears, it exposes and reveals anything and anyone who is not holy by virtue of his standard. No one claims to be perfect, he goes on to say, but there is, but there is not one in a thousand who understands the seriousness of not being perfect. So all of us, every person, you walk down the street, are you perfect? Oh, no, I mean, I'm not perfect. And, and if they believe in the concept of sin, oh, yeah, I sin. But does it matter to us? Does it matter? He said not one in a thousand understands the seriousness of not being perfect because the standard by which we will be judged ultimate, ultimately is not on a curve, me compared to you or vice versa, but will be the standard of God's perfection. That's what you're judged by. How do you measure up? There is, there, you can't even measure that on a scale of man's concept of perfection compared with God. But John Calvin says this. He says, as long as our gaze is fixed on the ground, we're safe. Whew. I'm just looking at everybody else. Okay, I'm better than this person, but maybe not quite as good, but still pretty good. If, as long as we compare ourselves to ourselves, we can find ourselves to be okay. But it's when we look up, and where did Isaiah see? He looked into the throne room of God, up to where God was. That's when he saw the reality. That's when he saw where he really was. Because ultimately, we can justify ourselves for just about anything. It just shocks me when you hear of things that, that uh, public figures do, politicians, whomever it may be. And before you know it, they're right back. Even, even ministers, they you know, commit egregious sins, and the next thing you know, well, you know, they're just human. I'm not saying that there can't be grace and, and people restored, but it's got to come with sincere remorse, sincere repentance, and, and a desire to truly be cleansed of that. But we, we find it so easy to justify ourselves. We're masters of self-deceit, and we're comfortable with our imperfection and we judge ourselves by each other. And I thought this quote from A.W. Tozer nailed it when he said, until we have seen ourselves as God sees us, we're not likely to be much disturbed over the conditions that are around us as long as they do not get so far out of hand as to threaten my comfort or my way of life. We have learned, he says, to live with unholiness and have come to look upon it as the natural and expected thing. Well, that's just the way we are. That's just the way I am. There's really no great desire for true holiness, for purity, for likeness to God, to be conformed to his image, he says. We become satisfied. We become content. Or we just think, well, it's just not possible. So, you know, why worry about it too much? As long as I don't do really bad things, I must be okay kind of, kind of concept. But Isaiah sees the reality. When he sees God for who God is, this true perfection, this true distinctness, this true authority and ruler over all things that will call all men before him, it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God, Hebrews tells us. But yet all things are laid open and bare to him with whom we have to do. He knows it all. He knows it all. And yet, what a terrifying thing to be in his hand. That's why Jonathan Edwards' sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Not every time it was preached had tremendous effect. But one in particular, there were people in that church who felt like hell was about to open up underneath them. They were going to fall in because they saw the reality of a holy God and what they were really like. It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So... It's the gravity, the, the seriousness, the reality of God's holiness that must be taken seriously. Therefore, how do I respond the same way that Isaiah did? Confession, acknowledgement, recognition, repentance. Oh, God, have mercy on me because I can't do anything. Have mercy on me. And some of us watched a revival documentary a few months ago. It really happened back in the 1940s, not all that long ago. 
in Scotland up in the Hebrides Islands. There was a dance hall of about 100 young people that were meetings going on at a church. The Spirit of God began to come down on that whole community. All those hundred or so young people left fleeing out of that dance hall because there was a terror that fell on them. The reality of their sin, and you can only explain that by the Spirit of God. And when Duncan Campbell, who was leading those services of preaching, in his own words, we've heard him say this, he said, as I was walking up to the pulpit, there were people just strewn all over on their faces. And one young lady was saying, Lord, have, is there mercy for me? Is there mercy for me? Because she knew she had no hope. She was undone. She was ruined. If you don't have mercy, God, I'm damned. There's nothing I can do. That reality has to hit us to know I have no hope. And yet it, there is hope. But it's only in Christ, not in anything that I can do. And if I am Christ's, then what will my life look like? How will, what will be the evidence? First John, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Peter says, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Now, he didn't say be as holy as I am. But be separate, be distinct, be set apart. You're mine. You belong to me. Look like it, act like it. Make that the intention of your life. Hebrews 12, but he disciplines us for our good. Why? So that we may share in his holiness. Have you ever thought about the things that are going on in your life? Could be there for the reason of helping us to share in the likeness of Christ, in his holiness. And then just a couple of verses later, he says, pursue peace with all men and the sanctification of without which no one will see the Lord. That word sanctification is the word holiness. Pursue it, the sanctification. Without that, you won't see the Lord, not my righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ being given to me and continuing to, to grow in that, in the likeness of Christ. So in Scripture, we see what makes something holy is just simply the touch of God. Has God touched this thing as he touched this person, then that person, that thing is holy unto him, separate unto him, belongs solely to him. We were bought with the price. Twice we're told that in Corinthians. We're bought with the price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. And in Zechariah, speaking of the day to come when the Spirit of God will be among his people, it says, In that day, so this is an Old Testament passage in Zechariah 14. Said in that day there will be inscribed on the bells of the horses. I mean, a simple thing out on the, you know, a plow horse. But this is what's going to be inscribed on those bells, holy to the Lord. And the cooking pots in the Lord's house will be just like the bowls that are before the altar. They're all holy to the Lord. Every cooking pot, he says, in Jerusalem and in Judah, Judah will be holy to the Lord of hosts. In other words, there's no such thing as sacred over here and secular over here. If I belong to God all of my life, whether I eat, whether I drink, whatever I do, do all to the glory of God. Am I separate unto him? Not am I pure, completely pure. Am I separate? Is it my desire to be cut, culled from the herd, separated unto God? That's what it means to be holy. To belong solely to God. Again, I compare it multiple times to the wedding, to the, to the marriage. You are holy unto your spouse. That's the only one you have, the only one you desire, the only one you hold to. You are holy unto one another, separated only unto each other. So if God has come to our lives, we're going to desire holiness. We're going to be like him. We're going to want to know what that's like. We want to see him more fully as he is. And we're going to, we will seek. We will seek. We will actively pursue to know God, to live like him, to, to, to honor him. We will live as a reflection that perhaps there will be, in a sense, a glow from our lives as it was from the face of Moses. We will honor God as holy. We will worship him in a holy way. We will recognize he is the Lord. He is the authority and all things are from him and for him and to him alone. He is the end of all things. Will God help us? Oh, I praise you that you have patience and mercy and long suffering and that you deal with our puny little finite minds over perhaps decades 
in revealing yourself and drawing us and instructing us. Lord, give us eyes to see, but, but we won't have that unless we have hearts. Lord, give us hearts that yearn after you to love you truly with all of our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength. Oh, God, give us those. Plant them in us. Give us that, that, that heart of, of flesh and remove the heart of stone. And, and, Lord, then just let us find our greatest enjoyment, our greatest longing is to know you as you may be known. We know that it will always be for our good. It will be for our joy, our fullness of life. And yet we so easily put you aside. Lord, help us. Help us by your grace to seek after you. We ask it in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and sing.